Good morning, friends. Today we are getting started on the Superstition Wilderness. Leaving from Roosevelt Lake, heading on up the mountain. Down here at a bit above 2,000 feet elevation, it's really freaking warm. So going up a couple of these hills, I am sweating. Got a little bit of a late start this morning and I'm paying for it with this heat, but so far the climb has been, I wouldn't say forgiving, but what I'm hiking on has been forgiving. I have this pretty well-groomed road, it's only really sketchy and really steep spots, but that just kind of is uh, uncomfortable either way. Um, this little jaunt I'm starting off on through the Superstition Wilderness, doing about 38 miles all together over today and tomorrow. And getting to the other side of the wilderness where I'm gonna have some water cached. My parents who were nice enough to drop me off at the trailhead this morning, are continuing on and going around these mountains that way. We came from that, that direction, driving back around that way and looping around so they can cash some water for me uh, for a little bit later today and for once I get out of the wilderness altogether. So the Superstition Wilderness earlier this summer had a really, really bad forest fire called the Woodbury Fire. It burned over 120,000 acres altogether and threatened the nearby communities of Roosevelt, Tonto Basin, and Pumpkin Center a little bit. And this section of trail I'm about to be hiking through, through this wilderness, was absolutely devastated. I'm curious to see the damage firsthand, but hiking through an area like this comes with many more risks. Trail signs that help with direction, completely burnt down. Trees that might provide a little bit of shade, completely burnt down. When the soils heat up to the extent that they do in a forest fire, instead of absorbing water when it rains, it repels the water, they become hydrophobic. And that makes it so Flash flooding risks in these areas are extremely, extremely dangerous. And if it starts raining, a lot of landslides happen in these areas. So definitely some very serious hazards that I need to keep in mind. And I've heard that many sections of the trail have washed out and they're working their best to repair it as they can, but that doesn't happen quickly. If you've ever been on a trail crew, you'll understand. So this next little bit, I'm gonna be really, really reliant on my GPS getting me to where I need to go. And fortunately, there is one stop for water in the middle of this wilderness. So as you can see, I'm on a road right now, so I'm not in the wilderness yet still six or seven miles from the boundary, but it's up a hill. <laughs> and at that boundary, there is a uh, trailhead. And at this trailhead, is where my parents are gonna be leaving my water for me. This will be my first time self-caching some of my own water. So hopefully it works out. There have been a couple of stories recently where people have put water out on the trail and they mark it like, hey, this is for so-and-so. Please don't use it before this date because I'm counting on it so I don't dehydrate. And people still have taken people's water and that puts 
immense risk on hiking these very arid sections of trail. Hopefully I don't fall prey to any of this, but it has been happening quite a bit recently. I don't know if this is unethical through hikers, I kind of doubt it, or if it's people who come out to these areas as day hikers, completely unprepared for what they face, and then they end up in a very bad situation and put others in a very bad situation as a result. So if you plan to explore some of these crazy, beautiful, yet arid sections of desert on the trail, be sure you plan ahead properly. So don't put yourself or others at risk. Oh, big hill. You can see a lot of these trees have been burnt. This is, I believe I'm now in that Woodbury fire zone. Just came across a few AmeriCorps volunteers that are fixing up the trail after this whole burn. The last group I just encountered had a big metal wire around a boulder. They're getting ready to winch it over and get it out of the way of the trail. I don't even wanna know how it got in the middle of the trail in the first place. There's a massive boulder, probably weighed as much as a car. I'm very, very thankful for the volunteers that come out here and do the Lord's work, so to speak. I hiked through a spot that they hadn't gotten to yet between Roosevelt Lake and here and hiking up Cottonwood Creek, the, was, you know, named after how it has a bunch of cottonwoods, which are massive trees that they just grow and grow and grow. I guess there was a really bad flood. I ran into a rancher as well who was talking about how his spring got all messed up and it was his first time out since the flood. And right after I get done talking to him, the trail just becomes absolute crud with huge fallen trees that you have to walk all the way around, make your own path and all this washout where you'd be walking and then the trail would just disappear or be a clear cut like straight down into the river. It's like, oh, okay, what do I do? So wayfinding was very difficult in that section. Then all of a sudden I turned this bend and the trail is perfect. Absolutely stunning, you know? Stairway to heaven status. Literally, they had stone rocks, made a perfect staircase. Some of the volunteers said that they've been out here working for at least a week, fixing it all up. And let me tell you, it looks absolutely stunning. Looks like I'm about to come up to their cars. Glad they didn't have to carry their stuff too far. They had a full on generator and crap too. It's heavy, metal with wire a generator and all their big tools you know making and maintaining these trails is no work for the feeble it's hard grueling work and I'm very very grateful for the, you folks out here making it a better place literally making the world a better place at least in my eyes so if any of you are watching kudos to you and keep up the great work. Hello friends. I just picked up that water my parents cashed for me earlier today. Thank you to you guys very, very, very much. I know that road was not fun for me to hike. I can only imagine how it was driving a truck up that. Thank you. I just filled up that nice little tree there. Drank a little bit of Gatorade. Had a little snack break. And uh, I'm ready to go. I really need to cover around seven and a half more miles today, but it's already close to two o'clock. So I might not record much more today. So I just need to hustle. Because my next water cache then is like 27 miles from me right now. I have a nice creek that's like 10 miles from me, but I know I'm not gonna get there tonight, but I'm like full capacity with water now, so that 
isn't a big worry for me. My concern is getting to where I need to get by Thursday. Because that's still about 44 miles from me. And between the next two days, I need to be there. So 222 milers doesn't sound like a bunch of fun. So I'm going to try and get that at least into the 30s. It's a little more doable. The trail's just been really rough today. So I'm going really slow. It's used up a lot of my time and energy. And I got a late start today, so all of these issues are kind of compiling on each other to try and foil my plan. So let's see what I can do to salvage it. I've literally looked at these mountains since I moved to this state in 2007. And they're practically in my backyard. And I've day hiked one area twice called Peralta Canyon, which is not really anywhere near the AZT. But I've never backpacked in this range of mountains, even though it's been so close. So I'm really excited to delve into it and sort of uh, understand my <laughs> the area around where I grew up, you know? I have a connection with it. A stronger connection with it. I think my biggest challenges in this wilderness area is the fact that it's in and out of a lot of canyons and valleys. So you go up a big hill, walk a ridge line for a quarter mile, Walk down a big hill and walk up a big hill. <laughs> Do it all over again. For contrast, here's an area that wasn't ravaged by the Woodbury fire. Still very, very healthy dwarf pines and junipers. Some scrub oak. Over on that hillside, you can see all the brown foliage. That part was affected by the fire. And up there, you can see a little bit of burnt. But in this valley, it appears that it was spared. Look at all these awesome little wildflowers. In the areas that were burned, not even the wildflowers popped up. The fire happened back in June, almost half a year ago, which is crazy. That's the kind of ecological destruction. It gets rid of the good soil health, gets rid of all those plants that hold the soil together, so erosion's a huge issue. And you can see the kind of biome that was completely obliterated. And now we're about to walk into a huge swath of the burn area. Or you see some contrast? No burn? Burn. Nothing was spared. Look at this. Oh my God. Even the other hillside has like nothing on it. Wow. Forces of nature, guys. <laughs> Not to be trifled with, that's for certain. <sighs> so these little green guys that you see on the ground. Like I'm not talking species. Just the little guys that are just starting to grow. In this burn area, obviously they're sprouted since the fire. In ecology, we would refer to these as the first secession. And what that means is those are the first organisms that come back into that ecosystem after it's been disturbed in some way. In this case, a really bad fire. And they start working with that lower quality soil. It's not high fertility. It doesn't have a bunch of organic matter. A lot of that burns off. So you're left with a lot of clay, clay and sand. And what, especially these guys, what they do is they prepare that soil and build it up back into that high quality medium that 
other plants will need to grow and succeed. And then you have the second succession and so on. And sometimes in these succession cases, the first seceders are these little ground crawlers like I was saying. And then the second succession comes in and can actually pressure them out or you know, build on it. So a lot of those second seceders are trees and things like that. Let's see if I could find another one of those cool ones I just pointed out. Here's one right in the middle of the path. This, I believe, is a mesquite tree. It looks very similar to desert acacia. That's why I say I believe, but those really long looking uh, leaves like this with the gills almost has a line of them. They're both, you know, very similar, a desert acacia or a mesquite. And both of them actually, they're trees, but they fulfill a very important role in the desert. And they're one of a few species that do that. They're not the only ones, but they are what are known as legumes. So they have these special bacteria that live in their root system because in the roots around all that dirt there's not a whole lot of oxygen so these are what are known as anaerobic bacteria they don't use oxygen they actually take the nitrogen out of our air which is what composes the majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen so they take that nitrogen they turn it from a gaseous state and convert it into a solid state, into the soil. What the nitrogen does is it basically works as a form of natural fertilizer for other plants to come in and for uh, obviously the tree to use. And other legumes that you might be more familiar with, something like soybeans. Most of these legume type species actually uh, make beans. I believe it's most, if not all, sorry, sweat in the eye, oh. so I don't walk up hill and talk. Anyway, legumes usually produce beans and beans are very high in protein. And the reason that these legumes make these very proteinaceous parts are because protein is actually made with a lot of nitrogen, go figure. So if you're doing your plant-based diet like I am, your main protein source, some of the really, really good proteins in plants are beans. So that's why so many vegetarian diets take advantage of advantage of things like black beans because those also come from a legume and that whole system of these legumes where they affix this nitrogen to our soil is basically the key that makes our planet's nitrogen cycle work. I just climbed like the hardest hill of the AZT so far. Probably not, but that's how it feels. That ridge all the way right there. I hiked down and down and down and down and fell on my butt and down and down and down and down. All the way to the bottom of that canyon and then all the way back out in the last 1.8 miles, I believe. 1,000 feet down, then 1,000 feet back up. Oh. Made it up here just before sunset. Now time to find a camp spot. Hello friends. All set up in camp now. <clears throat> All in my warm clothes. My Garmin says it's only gonna get down to like 66 tonight, so I'm not really hankering down, or hankering, hunkering down too much. What I am hankering for is the snack selection for the morning. 
five different flavors of Cliff Bars. <clears throat> Morning, friends. Last night was a little bit rough. Turns out that my inflatable sleeping pad has a leak. So I had to get up like every hour to reinflate it. I tried looking for a little pinhole for like probably an hour last night and no luck. So a little, a little restless. There was also some lightning, but I couldn't hear the thunder. So it's a little, uh, a little freaky, but we're good. And uh, I've already hiked about three miles today. Started about an hour and a half ago. We were moving a little bit slow and I uh, called my girlfriend once I got to a good ridge line where I could place a call. So it's good talking to her. And now we are just about at the top of Revis Gap, which some of the photos I took last night I'll probably put one in like here. That big bulwark of steep, jagged mountain, you know, that fortress you see. I'm basically sneaking in just to the left of that in a little slot between two of these, these vast walls. So you can see here, crazy walls on that side, crazy steep on that side. That's where I came from. And that's where I'm going. I'm really looking forward to getting to Revis Ranch. Apparently, there might be some apple trees there if they didn't all burn up in the fire because this area was affected by that Woodbury fire. A lot of these spots were. Fortunately, the hike so far today has been pretty much unscathed. So it gives me hope that, you know, one day it will all regenerate itself. You know, it does need fire to cycle in to make for uh, advances in the gene pool and all sorts of things like that. Once I get down off this ridge into the Revis Ranch and Revis Creek area, I believe I'll just be following Revis Creek up to its spring and then over Revis Saddle. So the next you know, six miles or whatever are gonna be pretty gentle following a creek. Hopefully it's not really bumpy. So yesterday I followed a creek that was very bumpy, so hopefully it'll be a little bit better. I have faith. And once I get down to that creek, I'll be able to, hopefully there'll be enough water to submerge my thermarest pad so I can patch a uh, hole on it and actually get some sleep tonight. <laughs> down there, that band of yellow in the middle of this valley, as I've talked about in some of my other videos, that's our riparian area. And that's where I'm headed for my water. That's Revis Creek. So Revis Ranch is gonna be up yonder somewhere. And I'm gonna follow this valley for the next few miles after I fill up and try to patch this hole in my uh, sleeping pad. So I dipped my sleeping pad in Revis Creek and found the hole. And now we're at the old Revis Ranch site. You can just see, obviously some ruins. When that dry out, gonna get a little bit of water. Maybe I'll patch it now, maybe I'll patch it, um, in, you know, at camp. I've already been down here for almost an hour, pumping water. I filled up a lot of water, probably two gallons worth, so. It's gonna be a heavy day. Friends, got through the wilderness. Third wilderness of the trail in the bag. 
So my Arizona friends, if you're curious of, okay, so you just walked through the Superstition Wilderness, where was Flatiron? What? That big bumpy mass out there in the distance, that's where all that is. This is how far back the Superstition Mountains actually extend. All this, still the soups. Before uh, this uh, backpacking trip, I didn't know that. I thought that that was it. It was wrong. But, kind of this whole area is definitely impacted by the volcanism that was present from that structure back there. That's, I believe, the main super volcano that used to be active in this area. I talked a little bit about that when I was going up Four Peaks, about how it used to throw giant fireballs that would form these massive boulders of granite. Well, there it is behind me. Kinda cool. And now, downhill we go. down that big old mountain right behind me. About three, just under three and a half miles from uh, my, my camp for tonight. I found out that my parents actually didn't cash water there. It's another three miles down the trail, but there's a lot of public water that's available for through hikers where I was planning on camping. So slight change of plans. I'm still camping in the same spot. I'm just gonna borrow from the cache the water that I'll need for this evening. Then I'll hike the you know, three miles or whatever to my cache tomorrow so I can camel up before my big push through the desert. Tomorrow I actually meet back up with my parents for resupply. I'm pretty excited to see some familiar faces. I haven't seen anyone out here all day and it's now four o'clock. So, I doubt I'm going to see anyone today. Good morning, friends. Had a bit of an eventful night last night. My patch, my patch on my sleeping pad helped a little bit, but it's still not perfect. So I had to inflate it like every two hours instead of one hour. It's at least 50% better. And around 2 a.m., I believe there was a bear that came into camp. I uh, woke up to a flat air mattress and some intense growling coming from a very short distance away. So I uh, started yelling at the darkness, as you do. You know, you got to intimidate the darkness. And uh, I heard it run back the way I came towards the mountain. So uh, it's a little sketchy, you know, waking up just a... I'm like, oh... Oh God. So uh, that was sketchy. I stayed up then from like two to like three, three thirty, to make sure he wasn't gonna come back. And as you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see it too well, but the area around me here, basically all mesquite and stuff that wants to stab you and saguaros. So I didn't think that I'd need to hang a bear bag. And uh, I found a tree nearby that I was able to hang one at like 2 a.m., but um, I got on my first drive, which is pretty good for me. Um, 
it was uh, a very big surprise that my first encounter would be in the middle of the desert. I guess it makes sense since I'm so close to the mountain, but like, it was sketchy, man. <laughs> I'm just starting to break camp this morning. I have about 17 miles to hike, and then my parents are going to pick me up so I could resupply tonight, camp with them this evening, and then get back on trail tomorrow morning. So that's sort of the plan, and uh, yeah, we survived. Just made it to my second water cache, so that's pretty awesome. Just a little note on this to fill you in if you don't know. Um, it says here, Private Jacob, my name, Frodo, my trail name. There are two types of caches, private and public. Public can be used by absolutely anybody. No one's planning on it, just take it as you need it. You'll find that at some trailheads out here, some supply boxes, things like that. On the back here, it says public after 11.10. So I had two gallons in this cache and I actually was doing really well on water so I could barely even fit that one whole gallon on my bag. So uh, this one is gonna be left for others. Not the 10th yet, that's in three days. That'll be fine. But um, it's really, really important if it says private and it's before that public buy date, do not take it because someone is counting on that and you could make someone literally die of thirst out of here. That's like leaving someone out in the desert without a horse, you know? So it's definitely uh, important to have water, obviously. So those are that's sort of an overview of uh, water caching. Since it's gonna be for public, I have it just kind of out there. It was stashed behind some bushes um, waiting for me. So yeah, that's a little bit on water caching. I'm carrying out my empties. I have one on the other side there too. And uh, yeah, about three miles into today, feeling good. We're gonna keep on keeping on. So obviously we're in a desert biome now. So that means there's a lot of different plants that we haven't seen on trail yet. This guy here, he's part of the Choya family. I believe that that is a staghorn choya, if I am correct. It's thicker than the buckhorn choya, which you see here. Let me get out of the way a little bit. And then here, this really fuzzy looking guy, so it's known as a teddy bear choya or jumping choya. These guys kind of suck. If you look, I just touch it. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, with those guys, if you even brush up against it, those little spikes on there will fall off extremely easily. And they, there's the main needle, and then on the sides, it's kind of barbed, except down the whole needle. So if you get it in your flesh, very difficult to get out and it's actually recommended at least out here that in your first aid kit you carry a fine tooth comb because that's basically the only way to get it off oh god and I'm walking through a forest of it now yeah here here's what the thorns can do and it, even just a gentle breeze can knock them off and into your path hence the term jumping choya I really don't want to step on any of those because they will probably go through these shoes. So a little survival tip for anyone who's out here exploring who gets in a bind. The flowers from, I believe, any cactus in this desert, all the flowers are edible. Even the ones from that, those jumping choya. Although it'd be risky to try and uh, get those flowers. Might hurt a little bit. <laughs> So that's a really good food source. But like those, the tall guys, those are saguaros. And they have flowers and their flowers are edible. But 
they're protected because they're a threatened species. So unless you're in a survival situation, don't go picking cactus blooms, especially from a saguaro. They need those blooms to reproduce and obviously they have such a slow life cycle that it takes a while for them to reach maturity. Right here, we have a fish hook barrel cactus and those little brown things at the top, those are its flowers. Whenever there are flowers, if it's fresh looking, you can cut it up and eat those. Those are actually really yummy. It's kind of like a kiwi, that slimy consistency with the really small seeds. And if they're dried up, you can just eat the seeds that are still gonna be in there. They're kinda, it's kinda similar to like a uh, poppy seed. So this tree right here with the green bark, it's one of my favorite trees of the desert because it's an absolutely evolved titan. It is made to be in this area. It's known as the Palo Verde, which is uh, Spanish for green stick. And the really cool adaptation that this tree has is it actually has chlorophyll in the bark. So it doesn't need to waste all of the water and energy on making leaves. There are leaves on it, but they are very, very small. And this tree is also a legume, which I talked about a little bit in that burn area. These make beans and in the soil, there's little microbiotic colony that affixes that nitrogen gas to the soil. And what those little nitrogen affixing bacteria look like, if I were to dig up this tree right now and look in the root system, you'd see a bunch of these little white nodes basically attached to the root system. And that's a symbiosis that this tree has with those bacteria. It's mutualism, which means they both benefit from it. If y'all remember me talking about the Superstition Mountains, I talked about how Weaver's Needle and Picket Post Mountain were two huge, huge parts of when this thing absolutely blew its top and you know blew up the whole super volcano, there were two huge structures of rock that got blasted out of the ground. That's Weaver's Needle and Picket Post Mountain. Saying behind me here, that's Picket Post Mountain. On trail, I've already gone over, I think 60 miles since that last boulder field up by Four Peaks. I'll plug in a clip right here of it. The same volcano produced both of these things. That's how absolutely epic of a cataclysm that was. Throwing boulders of lava everywhere, uplifting mountains and spires. There was some serious power beneath my feet here. And that's all because the magma that was produced by that volcano was extremely viscous. So it would build up the pressure and build up the pressure instead of blowing its top like, you know, say uh, the volcano on like Hawaii where it would just freely flow, the pressure would build up and build up until it has this explosion. Absolutely amazing. And it adds some very important context to this area. It's kind of part of the magic because, I mean, you could just say you're shuffling through a sandy, rocky, spiky field, but there is some serious, some serious stories to tell from these lands, even before humans were here, you know? Some epic stories for this planet, man. Absolutely amazing. I just passed the Hewitt Station Trailhead. I'm now headed to, about to cross the 60 actually, and then I'm going uh, to Picket Post Trailhead. Originally I was gonna hike to Forest Road 4, but I've heard conflicting information as to whether or not that road is open right now. So there is apparently a camp host at the Picket Post Trailhead. So I'm gonna get over there, see if I can get a clear answer to my question. <laughs> I'll check in with you guys in a bit.
So the parents just picked me up from uh, Picket Post Trailhead. Turns out Forest Road 4 was very washed out, very bad, and closed for mineral exploration. So, change of plans. I get a rest day today. It's about kind of off like seven miles of hiking, so feeling good. Yay, we're glad to see him. Ooh, did Survive. you already tell him about the bear? Oh yeah, I told him about the bear attack this morning. I have to say, that scared mom and pa. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> we're glad he's in one piece.